This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Skylar Bear. The story was recorded in January 2014 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The theme of the evening was Charting New Territory. So, almost a year ago now, I was sitting in a room with my dad, uh, just across the river actually, talking about the science of, I think, protein folding or neurotransmission or something that I don't understand, even though I like claim to being a biologist. And these kinds of conversations have gone on my entire life, um, where my dad says, hey, Sky, did you read about the science thing? And I'm like, no, dad, I didn't read about the science thing. And then he proceeds to tell me all about the science thing. And somewhere when he's talking, I say, well, shit, I should probably go look that up. And then I go read about it later. Um, And I think my favorite uh, memory of this um, from when I was a kid, I was probably about 10 years old. The internet had just sort of taken off, and my dad's a computer programmer, and he's like, hey, Sky, have you surfed the web yet? And I was like, you know, are we going to the beach? Did we go to the beach? And I don't remember. Is does this have to do with a spider, you know, the web part, or is it Charlotte's web? And my brother and I were just really confused. And my mother would refer to these as his Professor Bob moments. Um, His name's Bob. So with a science enthusiast for a parent, it's not really surprising that I have wanted to be a marine biologist my entire life. And I mean my entire life. Um, I say till the age of eight. Before that, I probably wanted to be a mermaid or something, but... Marine biologist is, you know, next best step. Uh, So I'm not one of those people that was a banker or something and went swimming with dolphins and sea turtles and was like, oh, marine biology and conservation is the path to enlightenment and fulfillment and da-da-da-da. Now, this is just, you know, on the agenda since age eight. And one of the things that I was obsessed with as a kid was uh, the sinking of the Titanic. And I would spend hours poring over this book called Exploring the Titanic. And I'd look at pictures of China and doll's heads and shoes of dead people. And I thought about the dead people. (laughs) And then I thought about the animals down there that ate their bones. And I was like, oh, I really want to see it. And I really don't want to see it either. So I was like simultaneously mortified and excited. And actually, when I was 11... I made this board game called Fraction Titanic. And you had to solve math problems to get to the lifeboat. And I thought, I thought it was hilarious because the Titanic broke in half when it sank. So, so hence the name Fraction Titanic. And I don't know if my math teacher ever, um, ever got that. But <laughs> I did. That's what counted. <laughs> So years later, I uh, got an internship as a college student at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I got to work with Dr. Lauren Molyneux. And one of the reasons I really wanted to work with her is because she worked on deep sea hydrothermal vents, the animals on, down there anyway. And I was just really excited that I would get to work with something from the deep sea. You know, my childhood obsession with the Titanic and the things down there. But I would get to look at dead ones, preserved ones, in the lab. You know, it was safe. It was in a lab. And that was still really exciting to me. But um, in these labs that get samples from the deep sea, they only have a few cruises per year, every few years. 
And as luck would have it, uh, there was one coming up in the fall. And it turned out that the postdoc in our lab was pregnant or something, and she just didn't want to go. So I got to go. I got to go. And I was like, oh, this is really exciting. But I'm also absolutely horrified <laughs> um, of being out in a boat in the middle of nowhere. And uh, on this boat, in order to go see these things, um, was the deep sea submersible uh, Alvin, which maybe some of you have heard of, maybe not. But it's one of the few manned submersibles um, in the world. And it's actually the same submersible that found the Titanic. So I was really excited, but <laughs> absolutely mortified. But because I got to go on the cruise, it didn't necessarily mean that I was going to get to go in Alvin. So it wasn't until probably a few days into the cruise that I found out that I was going to get to go. And so, again, excited and terrified. And one of the things that I was scared about was um, when they debriefed us about going down... Um, in Alvin is that, you know, you would, you would never get crushed because you have this pressurized titanium sphere that you're sitting in as the main cabin. But they said to us, they, they pointed to this lever at the bottom of the cabin and they said, so if you get stuck on the bottom, you have three days of food, water, CO2 scrub, air. But if no one comes for you, you just push this lever and it releases the cabin from the rest of the ship. And you would go shooting up to the surface. But since it's never happened, we don't know how fast you would go up. And I was like, great, I can't wait to die that way. <laughs> um, so, you know, we got debriefed. And then the day before my dive, the pilot, Bruce, comes up to me. It was like lunch. And he's like, so, who do you want to call when we're down there? And I was like, call? from a mile and a half below the surface of the water. What are you, crazy? <laughs> you know, and I was like, so I just said, um, what do you mean? <laughs> and apparently they had to test this underwater phone system for the next cruise where the scientist was going to talk to a classroom. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess, I guess I'll call my dad. I didn't have to think twice about it. I'll just call him at work, see what he's up to. Um, but we arranged it ahead of time, so it wasn't a surprise. Um, and so the next morning, I'm really nervous. I don't drink any coffee because uh, I don't want to have to make a bowel movement. And we all, and so I'm just going to explain to you more about what getting into Alvin is like. So only three people can fit in Alvin, and it's a six-foot diameter sphere. So that means that once all three of you, like, wedge in there, you could practically pay, uh, play patty cake, probably, you know, sitting cross-legged. You know, if you leaned over a little bit more, you could probably do it. So, and inside this patty cake um, sphere, you have basically the entire contents of a spaceship plastered all over the walls. Everything is like orange, red, yellow, maybe some green, um, just lights and monitors everywhere and screens. And then you have three tiny por portholes with, with glass that's probably at least three times thicker than like that on the Pope mobile or something. So, and you can barely put both of your eyes in it. Um, and there were some cameras to see what was on the outside. So we all get in the frame of the boat, um, puts Alvin in the water. Some of the crew are swimming to release the boat from, um, release Alvin from the tether it's on. They moon us, and that's great. And then <laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> They asked us if we saw some moonfish, and I did. Uh, I missed the fish, though. <laughs> and so we go down to the bottom, and we set up a call to my dad. And so the thing is with these calls is that everyone can hear everything in Alvin. They make a recording. Everyone on the bridge of the ship can hear it. Your advisor can listen to the tape later to find out what went wrong or what went right or whatever. So there are no secrets in this at all. And I feel sorry for anyone who thinks there are. Um, and so we set up the call to my dad. And one of the first things he says, he goes, so you see any giant squid down there? And I'm like, no, dad, it's hydrothermal vent. There aren't any giant squid down here. <laughs> it's like really embarrassed. <laughs> but I mean, what else was he going to ask, right? So, um, but I do start telling him about what is down there. And, 
you know, never in a million years would you guess what is at a hydrothermal event. You're sitting in this canyon, and there's all this shimmering water um, coming out of the cracks, and there are all these tube worms at all these strange angles, and they're white as bone with these bright red gills. It almost looks like a, a rose garden, but a very strange one. And there are all these white ghost crabs scuttling around and purple fish and just the most amazing things. And then you're just like, I am sitting on top of a volcano, basically. And, and it is so absolutely amazing. And I was just, I was just so impressed with nature <laughs> in that moment. And then the pilot asks me later on, he's like, so did the, uh, the, the dive deliver? We're still down there. And I'm like, well, I really wish that I had seen a Dumbo octopus. And then like 10 minutes later, a Dumbo octopus appeared. And it like flaps its ears. It's really cute. It kind of looks like Dumbo, except it's an octopus. <laughs> so, so it was just like the whole day was for me. But on the way back up, I really had to pee. So again, six foot diameter sphere, two men, me, 21 year old girl. And as a woman, um, you know, there's not a lot of head space and you have to get the right crouch going on. So your thighs are getting a workout um, to get the right squat position for peeing. And then you have this small red container to pee in, but then you also have this audited very, very uh, narrow um, female adapter. It's basically a funnel, but like not a helpful sized funnel. It was like <laughs> long and I was like, oh my God. So I had to like aim two things under my legs while squatting. And then in order to maintain some privacy, Um, Well, I had to sit in the middle of Alvin and put up two wool blankets that were basically cheek to cheek. And then I had two guys on the other side. And I had to pee so badly, like I do now, actually. (laughs) And and I was like, oh, but I don't want to pee too hard because I don't want to be that girl that peed all over Alvin. (laughs) You know, it's like the Bridget Jones of deep sea diving is just going through my mind. I finally peed a little bit just to relieve myself. And then we got back to the surface, and his tradition with first dive, they'd dump a bucket of cold water on my head, which made me want to pee even more. But it was like, it was like the best day of my life, really. You know, I got to go to the bottom of the ocean, and I got to share it. With all these people, that's what made it so great was that I got to share it with the crew, the pilot, uh, my advisor, classrooms that I talked to later on. I mean, and my dad, I got to call him from the bottom of the ocean. And I couldn't understand why anyone would want to go drill at these sites when there's so much biology there that you could study forever and still probably not figure out how they're even living off of a hydrothermal vent. Um, And... It is a day that I carry around with me everywhere, and it is a day that I got to be brave. I got to be like an oceanographic explorer like uh, Cindy Lee Vandover or Sylvia Earle, but not James Cameron. Um, (laughs) He was a he was a director first. And, and I got to be brave that day. And this day that I'm talking to my dad almost a year ago, I also had to be brave. And so did he and my mother and my, my brother and my whole family because the room we were sitting in was a hospital room. And my dad had just had the stroke of a lifetime <laughs> where we were lucky he was even breathing. He was pumping blood through his body and talking to us. And here he was saying to me what he said to me his whole life, so, Sky, did you read about the science thing? And I'm like, no, Dad. I haven't read about the science thing. And though I sound annoyed, it makes me so happy and so hopeful for both of us to hear him say that. Thank you. That was Skylar Bear. Skylar is a native to the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts. She's been pursuing a career in marine science since the age of eight and is currently working on her PhD in marine reproductive ecology at the Darling Marine Center in Wapol, Maine. She manages, edits, and writes for the blog Strictly Fish Wrap, strictlyfishwrap.com, sharing anecdotal science stories and writes for the National Shellfish Association newsletter. This past year, she was featured on the Colbert Report in a field report piece on the epic case of the missing scallop gonads. 
For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you're able, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Avalith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, and to Skylar for that Colbert Report piece. You really should go watch it. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.